Let's pray before we turn to God's word together. Holy and loving and perfect God, as we come before you today, we do that as your people. Your people who are deeply flawed. Your people who come with struggles and challenges and weaknesses and unrealistic expectations. Your people who come with hopes placed in all the wrong places. And yet we know that you promise to be with us. And that through the gift of Jesus, that, that you step into our human flesh, that you became one of us to rescue us. And so as much as we are struggled and flawed, we know that we are deeply and richly and truly loved by you, rescued by you, redeemed by you, and cherished by you. Lord, as we turn to your word this morning, as we reflect on your word already read for us by some of our children, we ask that it would shape and mold and transform us as we prepare to celebrate you today and next weekend for Christmas and all the days after that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I just want to say, uh, kids, I so appreciate uh, you sharing this morning and you being here all the time. You transform this church. You, you change the church. You uh, bring so much life and energy. And when we see you in Sunday school or see you in confirmation or we see you at ball hockey or we see you up here for uh, the children's message, it really does change uh, things. Your presence here changes uh, everything about our worship. There was someone who started coming to our church probably five years ago, and when I asked why they were here, there was just one reason. It wasn't because we were Lutheran, and it wasn't because we were biblically based, and it wasn't because you have a super handsome pastor. It was because there was kids here. This person had been at another church before, and seniors, we love you, but there was only seniors there. And this person wanted to worship where there were children, and so they came to this church. Your presence here makes things better. And we know that's true. I think lots of us have been invited to go out somewhere before and we've said this question, who else will be there? Right? You've asked that question before. Who else will be at this event? Because you want to know, are, will I know some people there? And often in our minds, there's a person or a few people where we know if they're there, it will be a good time. Oh, they're, they're gonna, uh, Bob Friedrich's going to be there? I'm there. That, that's going to be a good time, or whoever it might be. In fact, I want you to think of someone right now, just tell somebody sitting beside you, who's one of those people for you, where you know if they're at the event, it's going to be a good time. I'll give you 30 seconds right now. Turn and tell somebody. Okay, I like that. And one of the things I like is as you're doing that, you're all smiling and giggling and laughing because those people just bring a change. They bring some joy, some excitement to whatever it is. It could be the most mundane task, but if that person's there, it's going to be better. It's going to be more fun and more enjoyable. For me, one of those people in my life would be a guy named Greg Van Middelkoop. I met him in university, and uh, I just always think it's going to be fun. If he's there, this will be fun. And so one time, Miranda and I were moving from Vancouver to Edmonton to go to seminary, and she had to drive separately, uh, and so I said, I'm just going to get a ticket for Greg. I'll fly Greg out here from Calgary to here. He can't even drive. He couldn't even help me with the drive. I just thought, if he's in the moving truck with me, it'll be more fun. I didn't even ask him. He wasn't even in the country. He was in Europe, and I was like, I'm going to buy this guy a ticket, and when he landed, I said, I'll see you Friday. You're helping me move. Why? Because he's just that kind of guy, and I knew it would be better if he was there with me. Just by a person's presence, things can change. We know that's true for the positive. We also know that can be true for the negative. Oh, they're going to be there? Oh, well, i got to think about whether I want to go or not, you know. Uh, sometimes you just know as you talk to somebody, they, maybe something's going on in their life. I'm not saying they're a bad person, but you just get this feeling like this, is a, this person has some anger. This, there's a negative energy here, and, and if they're at the punch bowl, I'm going to just wait till they're gone before I circle around to the bowl again. 
one person's presence can have a big impact for the positive or for the negative. And if it's true for a single person, think of that reality with God. That if God is present, everything changes. That if God is going to be there, the whole scenario is entirely different because of his presence. Remember when God called out to Moses, right? God calls out to him from the burning bush and and tells him this plan that he's going to send him uh, to talk to Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world. And Moses' first response is this, no, I'm not going to do that. There's no way I'm going to go talk to Pharaoh. But I want to read just a couple verses for you of that conversation. Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. In the full exchange, Moses says, I can't go. I'm a nobody. I'm not the right choice. I'm not a good speaker. He gives all these reasons why his answer is a no. And God's real response to why it's going to be a yes is, I'll be with you. Maybe you can't do those things but I can do them. And he gives them a promise right here on the spot before any of it has happened. You'll lead my people out, and just so you know it was me who did all this, you're going to worship me right here in this spot. And then we see how that whole story unfolds. God's presence brings about all these plagues, and God's presence leads them away from Egypt with a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. God's presence parts the sea for them. When God is present the story is radically, drastically different. Later on, we see God present, leading his people that he's brought out of slavery into the promised land, and God's presence gives them victory over all of their enemies. Maybe that most famous battle would be the battle at Jericho. I'll read part of that for you. God says this, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its kings and its fighting men. This is before it's ever happened. But God says, I've already delivered them to you. And then he gives them these instructions. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the walls of the city will collapse and the army will go up and everyone straight in. I love this story. One of the things that's so great about it is that the victory only happens because God is present, right? It's not the trumpets, right? It's not that they were such good trumpet players. Uh, It's not because trumpets are a good military tool. Uh, We have a couple people in policing here. Have you guys been bulk ordering uh, trumpets lately? No. Craig, that's a no. Okay. Why not? Not super effective when, you, when there's a conflict, right? You're trying to arrest someone. Quick, get the ram's horn. We know, we know this only works because God is present. That's why there's power. That's why the trumpets and the marching work. It's all because of him. I just want to look at one more battle for you. This is a battling against a smaller city. In fact, it's so small, they decide not even to send the whole army. It's totally useless to march them all there because this is such an easy fight for them. But they lose that battle, and God explains to them why. God says this, Israel has sinned. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they've been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. So from their last battle, they took some things that God told them not to take, and when they march into this next battle, God says, you're on your own, guys. I'm not with you. In fact, I don't want you to win this battle. First, I want you to repent. First, I want you to go back to what I told you to do and be faithful to me, and then we can continue marching marching into battle. What a difference God's presence is makes now put all of that into the context of christmas god's presence makes the difference at christmas that's what christmas is all about that god comes to us that's what we've been looking at from the words of isaiah Uh, this morning i want to read uh, matthew actually quoting him and he writes this all this talking about the birth of jesus all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. 
The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's what happens at Christmas. That's what the whole story is all about, that this God who is sometimes present but sometimes distant now comes in Jesus, through Jesus, as the Son of God, God comes to us and says, here I am. I'm present with my people. Not a cloud, not a pillar of fire, but present as one of you. If having your friend with you makes a difference, imagine what having God with you in the flesh would do. Imagine how it would change that situation, that struggle that you're wrestling through. Jesus doesn't show up just for a party. He doesn't just show up for a weekend. He doesn't show up for uh, an event or for an afternoon. Jesus comes and lives among his people. That's what John writes for us in the first chapter of his gospel. He writes these words, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus came to be with his people. And that changed people's lives. It changed all sorts of people's lives. It changed the lives of people who Jesus said, you're forgiven. It changed the lives of people that Jesus told to you, uh, told to take up your mat and walk. You're healed now. Uh, who, who he healed so that they were blind and now they could see or they're lame, they could walk. They were dead and now they're alive. They were hungry and now they were fed. Through Jesus, all of these changes come about. They were outcasts, but now they were brought and invited in by Jesus himself. I think one reason there was always crowds of people around Jesus is because just being in his presence was so great. Just being near him was good enough. Which is interesting because the things Jesus said weren't always easy things. He didn't always make things harder, sometimes easier. Sometimes he made them significantly harder. Uh, like, uh, I don't know, can you think of anyone, anything he said that was pretty hard? Love your enemies. Yeah. Who's my neighbor? Uh, well, everybody. Uh, who should I love? Well, love your enemies. Uh, even pagans, they love the people who love them back. Uh, or what about deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me? There's a bunch of things Jesus said that are actually harder than what people would have... Yeah, but, yeah, but what commandment is the greatest? He says, yeah, those are pretty good. How about this? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. These are hard things to do, and yet people loved being in the presence of Jesus. It's easy for us, I think now, 2,000 years later, after the birth of Jesus, to do this, to say, oh, if only we were there when Jesus was around. That would have been amazing. Or say, oh, if only we were there in the Old Testament when God was doing these great big miracles, that would have been amazing. It's kind of easy to look back and say, well, that would have been so great. And yet the people of the Old Testament would have never dreamt of what we experience today with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Even the people in Jesus' day didn't really get it when he said to them, listen, it will be better for you, actually, that I do leave and go to heaven because then I'll send the Holy Spirit to you. Jesus doesn't say, sorry, guys, I can't stay here forever but kind of the consolation prize is the Holy Spirit. You know, like, that'll be okay. Jesus says, this is better. This is better by far. This is going to be so great for you. Not just God in a cloud. Not just Jesus as God in one place at one time, but the Holy Spirit with all of his people all of the time. I think sometimes we forget as we look at the Christmas story that God is present with us now. That Jesus remains present with us now through and by his spirit. That we can say have the same power that was present in the Old Testament is actually alive and at work in us. We can have the same peace that Jesus brought right here, right now, alive in us through the Holy Spirit. Matthew's gospel ends with these words from Jesus. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus is present with us. Till when? till the end, for o forever and for always. In Galatians 2, Paul writes this, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Yes, Jesus has ascended and he's up on the throne, but Jesus is also fully present today with us 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is present. Jesus is present with us. In John 14, Jesus says this, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Do you think about that very often? I I think we get excited about some of those miracles in the Old Testament as God shows up, or I think we get excited about Jesus being laid in the manger, or we think about even Jesus on the cross, but I think sometimes we forget the reality that God is still present, that he's present right here inside of me and right inside of our young people who are leading today and right inside of of our seniors who have been worshiping faithfully for generations, right inside of you as you trust in Jesus. That's only possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is in us. In Isaiah, we hear these beautiful words, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Beautiful. I mean, I mean, I love the sound of those words, but also unto us is given the Holy Spirit poured out on each and every one of us. I mean, there's, there's a, something so miraculous in that that only God would ever think of and only God could ever accomplish. And what that means is you're not alone. It means you're not alone this Christmas. Whatever you're facing, whatever's going on, whatever you're most excited about, you're not alone in that. For some of you, you're facing big challenges, uh, big losses, big fears, big guilt, big regrets, big shame. Maybe for some of you, this is a first. Maybe this is the first Christmas without somebody that you have loved dearly. Or maybe it's not the first, but this year it's just hitting you harder than normal. Maybe this is the first year your family can't all get together, or maybe there's a rift in the family. Maybe uh, for some reason you were seeing someone and that ended, or maybe you, uh, your family is separated this year, or maybe you lost your job this year, or maybe you have a change in your health. Whatever it might be, you are not alone. Why? Because the Jesus who is present in the manger is present with you by his Holy Spirit. And whatever obstacle, whatever loss, whatever challenge, whatever fear, whatever doubt, whatever pain you're experiencing, you don't have to go through that alone. Because you're not alone. God is present with you. And then he does something so unique is that he says, I'm present with you, and he sends us out, but then he also gathers us in. I love how the Bible tells us, do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but keep on gathering together. Why? Because as we gather, we gather with other people who also have the Holy Spirit in them to speak into our lives, to share our burdens and our griefs, to point us back to Jesus and to lift us up. Church, whatever you're going through this year, maybe it's all good things, maybe it's all celebration, praise God for that. Know that it's even better because God is present with you. And if you're going through challenging things, That's okay, challenges are real, but know that you're not alone, that God is present with you, and that he has brought this group of people to support and uplift and encourage and strengthen you. God is present with you through his word, he's present with you through his spirit, he's present with you through these broken and frail people gathered around you who also love Jesus. He's present through his very own body and blood, which he provides for us once again today. This is one of those hard teachings that Jesus shared where lots of people walked away from him. And yet it's also one of his very greatest gifts. I want to read just a few words Jesus spoke from John 6. It says this, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. What a beautiful promise that is. Uh, As beautiful... And as miraculous as unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in them. Christ in us, God in us, this is our hope, this is our power, this is our peace, this is what we're celebrating as we gather together this Sunday and as we gather again for Christmas. May you know and experience And trust in the presence of the God who loves you so much. He came for you. He lives in you. And he gives himself to you again this morning. Amen. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning as we gather that your word and your promise remains true. And so as you promised to us to send your spirit, as you promised to us, Jesus, that you would never leave us, we can trust that promise. Since you've kept all your other promises, we can trust that you'll keep this one to us as well. And so God, as we are a gathered people with challenges, with doubts, with fears, with struggles, with pain, with joys and hopes and joyful expectations. May we rest all those things on the certainty of the promise that you're with us. Lord, we pray for those people who aren't able to gather here this morning because of the snow. Lord, we pray that you would remind them of your great love for them. Lord, for those people who are going through great losses or doubts or fears or whatever else it might be, that they would know that you're present with them and they don't need to go through those things alone. Lord, we pray for this group of people who faithfully gather to worship you here. Lord, I pray that we would be moved to to a, a deeper level of honesty and transparency with one another so that we could share those things we're struggling with and allow other people to share those burdens with us, to lift us up, to pray for us, to care for us. Lord, we pray for people who will be traveling over the next couple weeks, that you would get them to their destination safely. We pray for those uh, who are struggling financially. We thank you for all sorts of different organizations like the Food Bank and for the uh, Cloverdale Community Kitchen and the Hamper program they just did. We pray that those gifts and that food would be multiplied and that all those people who received there would, would have caught a glimpse of you and your love through the people who served them. And we thank you for the people who put in countless hours to make that possible. Lord, we pray for those who will be alone this Christmas that they would know that they're not alone, that they would experience your presence, and that us, as a body of believers, would be, that we'd be faithful in reaching out to those around us, that we'd be inviting people to gather at our tables, that we'd be inviting people to join us for our celebrations. Lord, for everything else on our hearts and minds today, we commit all those things to you, trusting in your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 